GH1 TV, your best experience. Hello there, good morning and welcome to GH1 Newsroom. My name is Sewa Amir. The news is coming live uh, to you live from our Platinum Studios here at Ridge in Accra. And also we are live across all our social media platforms and also live on DSTV Channel 361, GoTV 179. Let's begin with our top stories. Coming up this morning, scores of patients left stranded and battling for life at the Kolebut Teaching Hospital due to lack of space to accommodate them. This morning, we'll bring you the latest on the seeming healthcare crisis which has hit the country's major referral health facility. And pregnancy by chance and not by choice as 17% pregnancies in Ghana go unwanted. Today's newsroom also takes a look at this year's World Population Day, which addresses family planning as a human right. Also coming up, water supply in trouble as encroachers take over wager dam buffer zones, costing population an increasing cost of water treatment. And later on the foreign front, Ugandan police fire tear gas and live bullets to disperse protesters over social media attacks. We have details of these stories and many more coming up shortly. Do stay with us. Some, some of them are just hang, hanging around here. My cameraman is just going to you saw you just see a few of them. They are here waiting to hear from the doctors what is happening. Some are going in to get chairs for their, their relatives so they could be attended to. So there are lots of people here actually just hoping that their relatives will be given the needed attention that they deserve. But I have some with me. I have a family here I'm going to engage in a bit. He brought his relative here as at 6 p.m. yesterday. And he's going to tell us the situation now. Good morning and welcome to GH1 TV. Okay, good morning. I'll hold it for you. Yeah, okay. Good so, I want to find out from you. You brought your relative in. Yes. Um, you were just having a discussion. Tell us what time and then tell us if he or she has been able to get a bed to, to I, now. I, I brought cases so far. It has reduced from 60 to 51. And more people are coming in actually. And I hear they are turning them away because they cannot be able to take care of them here at the Kolebu emergency. Yeah, but Dala, you talk about more people coming in and being turned away. Have you cited any yourself? Okay, so um, we were here when um, a gentleman was brought in a taxi, um, but we were being told that they had to know the severity of his, of his condition. So um, they were just explaining to us that they have what they call the green, the red, and the yellow. When you come in and then your referral shows that it's very critical, that is you are around the red belt, you'd have to be... Hello, Dala. Take you back. Well, unfortunately, we've lost Dela, but we, we, well, I understand Dela Michelle is back on the line. Hello, Dela, can you hear me now? Dela, can you hear me? Well, before we go back to Dela Michelle, the news team was at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital yesterday, and Odilia Ajiman Prempe reported that some patients in critical condition at the surgical and emergency unit of the hospital had to either sit in an individually patronized plastic chair or lie on the floor to receive treatment. Since you know, Anapa, I'm watching him as Anapa. Yet now, side Gina was a empire didn't better on your baby. Agent, I want the horses in Sina, a new name, and my Mikuta. Also, you know, see Papa is so sad. Me knew a mamma and a buy, ye buy win Sunday. No, ye buy, yes, we will, ye yampa, no remum, no crano, or so be na. Okay, 
up to now. But um, soon they will be attended to. Some are receiving drip even in the chairs. Some have oxygens on them even as they're sitting in the chairs. So it's, it's a big issue here for them. Um, I, I went out to find out if this has affected the staff, but the staff has not been affected. The number of staff has not been affected. It's just that the beds are not enough um, to accommodate the people that are coming in. So when you come in and you're on the green belt, you'd have to be sent back to the um, hospital where you're referred from. Some are coming in with cases that need um, special attention, like they need special equipment that can only be gotten here across. So with those people, they have been brought in. But as we speak, um, so I just spoke to a family member. She brought in her relative yesterday. And as of today, she's been asked to go somewhere else to conduct um, tests. So she's actually waiting for the ambulance to come in and then pick the relative from here. Hopefully, she's saying that hopefully when she comes back, the bed on which her relative was lying on will not, have, will not be given to somebody else. So at least the relative can come back onto the bed that she was lying on to receive further um, treatment. So that is what is happening. They're looking at the severity of it. Green, blue, green, sorry, red and yellow to determine if the cases should be attended to here at Kolebu or they should be taken back to the hospitals where they were referred from. But Dela Michelle, that's, 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 that's very unfortunate because if, if a doctor knows that a case will be referred back to where um, it was sent from, why send it out in the first place? That's just one point. The second thing is you have been there for a while now. Does it look like the hospital has a contingency plan to take care of all of this in the meantime? I think that um, when, when I spoke to one of the, he's actually from the PRO department, he said he's not um, permitted to speak on camera, so I was having an interaction with him. And he's saying that they are hoping that an old OPD will be open as soon as possible so they can actually take the numbers that are coming in. Now, I'd want to say that according to him, this has been an issue here at Kolebu. The surgical medical unit can only take 36 patients at a time. So whenever patients are brought in and they are told to go back, it's sometimes not because there are no beds, but even sometimes they are dealing on excess. So that is what is happening right now. It has been a, a challenge here at Kolebu for a while, but it looks like this time around, because of the directive that was also given by the Ministry of Health not to turn away patients, more and more people keep coming in, and that is what they are facing in here right now. So they are just hoping that those who will be brought in can be attended to immediately here and then sent onto the ward but they are saying that that is also the situation on the wards where some do not have enough beds to accommodate these patients that are coming in so it's a major challenge and they are hoping that the former OPD that um, unit that has been closed down will be opened again um, in a report that Odilia they, they mentioned the, tw the 20th of July so they are hoping that 20th of July the facility will be put in place so everybody coming to the surgical emergency unit will be sent to that particular facility I understand that it's 70 it's a 70 um, bed capacity so it will be able to take at least 70 people. And if here should take 36 people, it looks like more and more people will be having access to quality education, to quality health, if it should be open, Sarah. Della, last question before I let you go. I don't know if you were able to establish this from the authorities that you spoke with, but is there some sort of communication that goes around the major hospital so that when, before a doctor refers a patient to the Kolebu or wherever it is, they check whether there is a bed did you did you did you did you find that out? So before they not, send a patient there, they don't just send on that on Right, they'll go on. Not not on, on that issue. Not on the issue that they are able to find out from the hospitals before, but now I think that they are, they are beginning to establish um, contact with these hospitals where these um, cases are coming from. The guy that I spoke to did mention that now they would actually hope that these hospitals that are referring the cases will give them a call to find out from them what is really happening. But that was not said by the PRS. I said he's a member of the public relations team here at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. So that is what he made me understand. That now calls, they are reaching out to these hospitals to find out from them to make sure that before a case is even brought to Kolebu, they should give them um, the severity of that case before it's brought here to Kolebu, and if not, they can handle it at their um, facility. All right, thank you very much, Dela Michelle, for that beautiful report. Dela Michelle is our reporter at the Surgical and Emergency Unit of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Let's still stay on health, but this time in the Ashanti region, because management of the Suntreso Government Hospital in Kumasi has attributed the death of a 30-year-old pregnant woman and her unborn baby to inadequate theater beds at the hospital. It was reported that a 30-year-old pregnant woman died at the Suntreso Government Hospital in Kumasi on Wednesday. Wednesday, 4th July 2018, after the health facility refused her entry into the labor ward because her husband could not immediately pay a 500 doctor motivation fee.
Angela Efrie Ajimai died at the theatre just as her husband had made available the 500 Ghana City fee for which she had been allegedly denied medical attention. The medical superintendent of the Suntreso Government Hospital, Dr. Ejako Puku, debunked the allegation made by the deceased's husband, Solomon Lamo Latif, at Suntreso Government Hospital, told him to pay 500 Ghana cities as doctor's motivation fee. It is not true that we deny the woman labor because we move from there before we come to the theater, unless we have been booked for CS. This is a woman who works here. So the normal practice is to send you to the labor ward, we tried, and when we are not successful, we take you to the theater. So the woman was never denied the labor ward. Dr. Ejaku Poku added that Suntresu Hospital has only one theater bed, which was then occupied by an operation patient. He explained the deceased and her unborn baby died when she was sent to the theater room for treatment after she waited for some time due to inadequate theater beds. According to the report given to us by our staff, there were other cases. We have only one theater, one theater bed, so there was another case there. Why they were they finished the case before they sent this woman in. And that is what when it happened. Meanwhile, the Ghana Health Service has begun an investigation into the matter. Now, a man believed to be in his mid-40s was involved in a hit and run on the Awoshi Ablekuma Road last week. A sympathizer brought him to the Kolebu Tichin Hospital and he is currently receiving treatment. He cannot tell his name as he is in coma, but my colleague Odili Ajiman Prempe has more in the following report. The man cannot talk as he has been in coma since he was admitted at the hospital. He is assumed to be married because of a wedding band that adorned his ring finger on his arrival. The man, believed to be in his middle 40s, was run over by a car and left at the scene to die. He is dark in complexion. He was brought to Kolebu Accident Unit by a good Samaritan and is currently receiving treatment. A nurse, Augustina Yabua, is asking the public to help identify the family of the unknown patient. He's been on deeply unconscious since then, and nobody has visited. If somebody is not seeing the relative for a long time, he should come to Kolebu Accident Center. Meanwhile, this man has also been here for about a month now. He has refused to tell his name. Nurses here say he's mentally deranged. This one too was brought by the police people. He was found also outside. He came here conscious. But um, he had a problem with the ribs. So we put in chest tube, both bilateral. Uh, you drain air and blood in addition. By God's grace, that one has been subsided. They are seeking the public's help to locate the family members of these patients. Now, today is World Population Day, and the day has been set aside by the United Nations to focus attention on the urgency and importance of population issues. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the 1968 International Conference on Human Rights, where family planning was for the first time globally affirmed to be a human right. The conference's outcome document, known as the Teheran Proclamation, stated strongly that uh, parents have a basic human rights to determine freely and responsibly the number, of, uh, the number and spacing of their children. For many women across the globe, family planning is by chance rather than choice. While the ability to control the number and spacing of one's family was affirmed as a human right nearly 50 years ago, because of a lag in access to reproductive resources such as contraceptives, the stark reality hundreds of millions of women face is that family planning is not a guarantee. That's the message the United Nations Population Fund wants to underscore as it marks World Population Day on Wednesday, which aims to highlight urgent issues facing the international community. While the population today nearing 7.5 billion globally, census experts predict that by 2030, the number will rise to 8.6 billion, roughly adding 83 million people each year to the planet. In Ghana, the problem with rapid population growth and high fertility rates is that they hurt economic development. 
uncontrolled population has led to poverty, unemployment, insecurity, environmental pollution, high dependency ratio, inadequate health facilities, overcrowding, decline in land quality and in per capita food consumption. With an economic growth that increases slowly, Ghana is already grappling with its high population growth. With limited economic resources, it has become difficult for the government to adequately provide social amenities for its citizens, such as food, shelter, proper education and healthcare facilities. Close to 25% of the population lives below the poverty line. Ghana's poverty level has declined to about 24.2% from the 51% recorded in 1991. This means about 24.2% of Ghanaians measuring some 6.4 million cannot afford to spend 3 cities and 60 pesos on food a day. The people below the poverty line were about 7 million in 2005. Meanwhile, former President Jerry John Rawlings has said one of the key factors for the country's high poverty rate is the lack of family planning. Speaking at this year's June 4th commemoration, ex-President Rawlings said Ghana will face a lot more challenges if measures are not put in place to curb the rate at which citizens give birth. That if we're not going to do something about family planning, we will be impoverishing ourselves. Hardships. We'll be inflicting hardships on our lives. The white people in the developed countries also used to discard family planning. Competition between Protestants, Catholics in America, in other places. Till they began to wake up to the value of family planning. They could make money and savings, not just as a nation, but it started in the home. How can you afford mosquito proof when that money has to feed someone? When we have four, five, six mouths to feed, how can they stay healthy? Ladies and gentlemen, I said, if we do not start doing something about it, the lack of family planning will become a coffin on our heads. Let's take it seriously. Well, that makes sense. But the decisions concerning the number of children a couple should have are usually very personal. But the reality is that this fundamental human right comes with complications, especially when parents have a low income. The National Population Council of Ghana is therefore advocating accessible and affordable family planning services across the country. The council is afraid the population explosion can affect Ghana's development. But are people ready to employ family planning services? Alice Aite has been engaging the issue. 34-year-old Alice Jew is a mother of five at Koligono, a suburb of Accra. She had her first child at the age of 21 and tells me although she was not ready, she eventually had to start making a family. Within a short period, she and her husband had reproduced about four more children with the last one being just three months old. Alice explains life is tough for her family of seven. <laughs> Decisions concerning the number of children a couple should have are personal, but it has implications. Just like many other people, Alice has her own reservations about family planning and says she is not ready to use any contraceptive, although she wishes not to give birth again. Why in a cancer? Because say a young mother advert what TV saw. 
omuka se o we bia ya en ma o se enye o sa advert ndi o moye pa na so me de me ninje ho across the world some countries with faced explosive population growth have come up with birth control policies that are working for them. China, for instance, has the one-child policy. In India, the state offers newly wedded couples cash grants to wait for two years before they have their first child, while in other parts of that country, having more than two children disqualifies one from holding public office. But here in Ghana, there is no such policy, a reason some stakeholders believe the country's population growth may affect development. Dr. Leticia Apia is the executive director of the National Population Council. She is calling for the family planning services to be made easily accessible and affordable. Well, the women are getting pregnant to babies they don't want, but for lack of Probably family planning uh, service. When you go to any community, you, you, you're supposed to be able to have a family planning service anytime you want, anywhere, just like the weighing, just like the immunizations. So now all the children are immunized. You know, you get about 77% of our children being fully immunized. But family planning uptake is less than 30%. The council is alarmed by the annual population growth, which has for the past three decades grown by 2.5% yearly, translating into between 700,000 and 800,000 people. This rate is more than the global target of annual population growth of 1.5%. However, speaking in an interview with the news team, a senior research fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Professor John Asafwe disagreed with the National Population Council's figure. The growth rate has actually been trending downwards. So it was 3.54% in around, I think, 82, 83. And currently it's about 2.2%. And the projections show that by... 2040 it will be about 1.7 percent. So naturally, it's trending downwards. Uh, in other words, people are having fewer children. I believe education is one of the reasons. You know, it is still a concern because by the year 2040 we will have about 44 million people in Ghana, which I think is a lot. He was worried that shrinking job market and the weak economy are compounding the already harsh economic matters. He, however, joined the head of the Population Council to advocate easy access to contraceptives. We need to anticipate, you know, that there are going to be more people living in the cities by 2030, 2040. Uh, and so, you know, the city um, planners and decision makers, policy makers should prepare. So that still means that we should prepare. But personally, if you look at the statistics, uh, I, I think it's encouraging in the sense that p people are tending to have fewer, families are tending to have fewer children. Until concrete policy is put in place to check the country's population growth, many families will continue to be impoverished. Alice Aite, GH1 News. Let's still stay on this a bit longer and go live to the Volta Regional Capital Hall where this year's national commemoration is taking place. Francis Suetuakucha is a senior population officer of the National Population Council and he joins us live over the phone. Hello, sir. Thank you for your time. But first of all, is the, is, is the growth in the country's population a positive or a negative one? Hello? Hello, sir. Can you hear me? No, I can't hear you. Probably. Right. It's good to have you. I'll, I'll take my question again. I asked, is a growth in a country's population a negative or a positive one? The growth of the population could be negative or positive. If the population grows positive, uh, in a quality form, then I would say that the population is growing positively because it will have positive impact on the population. You know, maybe people are growing, they are educating, they are having profession skills. You know, this will help to propel the nation forward. You know, 
we could have people doing so many things, opening up businesses, and it will tend to propel the nation forward. Hello? So you are explaining? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you very loud and clear. Yes. So these are some of the uh, implications when we have quality population. But then when we don't have a uh, quality population where people are not well educated, people will have health conditions, you will see that the nation will be drawn uh, backwards in the sense that people will become uh, involved in criminal activities, you know, drawing the nation backwards in, in a negative sense. So these are some of the uh, uh, things that affect the population. Right. Uh, sir, for the sake of time, I don't have a lot of time, but every year we mark the National Population Day. Do, yes. Would you tell us that after today's commemoration, things are going to change when it comes to uh, family planning and uh, the, the rate at which the population of the country is growing? Yes. You know, we are trying to uh, uh, emphasize the public that uh, family planning is a human right. You know, this year, uh, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the 1968 Conference on Human Rights, where there was a declaration that family planning was a human right. You know, so we are trying to make the public aware that family planning is a human right in the sense that government should provide access to free family planning, you know, uh, scientific knowledge, family planning, access to family planning, and also parents must have the right to give the number of children they want, as well as the spacing of children to their liking, so that they can afford all the responsibilities that comes with it right. for the development of the nation. Okay. Other than that, yes. M M Mr. Akucha, I, 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 I have to let you go, but the last question, we cannot talk yeah. about the growth of the growth in population and family planning without talking about teenage pregnancy. Now, how does exactly. your outfit and the entire country as a whole, how do you want us to address the issue of teenage pregnancy? Well, you know, teenage pregnancy is uh, growing in the Volta region. When we look at the data we have, you know, 18% is quite a little bit uh, significant. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to sense That's why we're having the Population Day, World Population Day, in a proper day, mm -hmm. Gorgame, so that we can sensitize the voter region mm -hmm. on family planning. Now, teenage pregnancy, teenagers have the right to access, you know, free family planning that will help them you know, to say they are reproductive rights. You get me? Uh -huh. So this celebration is to sensitize the public that uh, family planning is a right. So teenagers have the right to assess family planning. They must also have the right knowledge to contraceptive use. All right. And also treatment regarding their reproductive health. All right, thank you very much. Francis Sueto Akucha is a senior population officer at the National Population Council joining us from the Volta Regional Capital Hall. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Now, the lives of residents and road users of Tema Community 22 and its environs are in serious danger due to a collapsed bridge which has left portions of the major road hanging precariously. As Isabella Baba Frimpon reports, the structure has become a death trap threatening lives and property. This is the Tema Community 22 Night Avenue Road. Trails of destruction by torrential rains, a death trap, residents here call it. It doesn't affect anybody actually, but what actually happened is uh, it's very dangerous. So people came, people came to put this line and also put things here because it's very dangerous because it's a double, uh, that's a, a road that car used to. Uh, pass now two cars cannot pass at the same time unless some stopped and all that also will pass before they come that's how it used to do the looming danger has compelled most drivers from using the stretch this situation has brought a great discomfort to residents and those living in adjoining areas 
school pupils who ply the road daily face the greatest risks. They are in fire, Papa, Papa, because. Se obi cry and area ha twenty two hana se or bano nim se bridge be can be timi asama so that a prano and I even cry on kwala cre if you school ban on with dear gra obi betimi atum the way I deny in dear a year very risky and ya cra na semi man so cry ye who no pona ye who need din ye nim ni din and see ya pamu chawara uh mo usual semi man my no maya my so to us I will fa how to me fa Sessan Aka, you be saying, not a be so bad, this a witchina. Now we trim, and Sana, we so banya coin a trim. A boy on Quadanumu coast to no more bar. Omofana am or almost almost shed. Sana a book home, no more shed. One say, and young Quadadio bets me a cotuna or the Ohawaba. The broken bridge has been left unattended to, in spite of numerous distress calls to the Ashamine Municipal Assembly to have it repaired. The next time that it rains, I don't know what is going to happen. So I'm um, pleading if they could come to our aid because I've got hooked up here before. I was coming reverse with my ride and people had to push me. I nearly fell inside. And I think this can happen to somebody. Some people might not know maybe the road is damaged like this. They might be on their top speed coming. So please, we are begging. Efforts by the news team to get responses from the Ashaimai Municipal Assembly were unsuccessful. Residents are therefore appealing to the authorities to, as a matter of urgency, get the bridge fixed before any casualties are recorded. Let's take you live to Parliament now because we understand the Foreign Affairs Minister Shirley Ayoko Butri is standing by to address the floor. But before we do that, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Adudankwa Ikufado, has revealed that his government has set up its first cattle ranch in their farm plains to help deal with the Fulani headsmen and cattle menace. Speaking at Adaklu on day two of his three day tour of the Volta region at the sword cutting ceremony for the construction of a multi purpose youth and sports resource center, President Ekufado stated that in fulfillment of the pledge he made in the run up to the 2016 elections, his government has begun the construction of ranches across the country. According to President Akufuado, the first ranch has been established at the Afran Plains and government has chosen several sites around the country where it is going to establish these ranches in order to bring the cattle into safe and secure environments so that the desecration of the lands will be a thing of the past. <laughs> Let's take you to Parliament now. My colleague Ibrahim Al Hassan is standing by to bring us details of what the Foreign Affairs Minister has been saying on the floor of Parliament. Hello, Ibrahim. Hello, Sewa. What can you tell us? What has the minister been saying so far? Well, the Foreign Affairs Minister, Sally Ayokoboche, uh, came to Parliament to brief the House regarding the Libyan crisis, specifically talking about the number of Ghanaian migrants who are stranded there. And this was what brought the minister to Parliament. For instance, there's a question from Busa South MP, Dr. Clementa Park, that sought to find out from the Minister of Foreign Affairs if the ministry is aware of report by the International Organization for Migration, that's IOM, that 62,422 Ghanaians are stranded in Libya, over 62,000. Her answer was a simple one. They are conflicting figures coming from the IOM office here in Ghana and the IOM office in Libya. Uh, two, there is a challenge in verifying these figures, uh, given the conflict situation Libya is in. According to the minister, government dispatched a team to Libya on a fact-finding mission. They were able to visit just about six camps and they discovered that there were only 72 Ghanaians who have been repatriated as we speak. The challenge is that there are rebel groups who are fighting in all the other parts 
of Libya, except Tripoli, which has, uh, which is in the control of uh, government forces. So it is only Tripoli that these, this team, which went on a fact-finding mission, was able to visit. So what she is saying is that, yes, she's not disputing the fact that, as we speak, there are some Ghanaian migrants who are stranded in Libya, but the numbers are difficult to confirm. And nonetheless, she's saying that they are monitoring the situation. In fact, as we speak, there is a consulate, the Ghanaian consulate that has been opened in Libya and that the ambassador there is monitoring the situation. There's a team there also monitoring the situation. If they realize uh, that the numbers are large enough and that the situation is getting out of hands, government will repatriate uh, these migrants. Yes, so in essence, what Shelly Ayokobo, the foreign affairs minister, is saying is that indeed there are some stranded Ghanaians in Libya. Figures not known are uh, given the conflict situation in that country. They are liaising uh, what ECOWAS, AU, uh, the UN, the IOM to ensure that if indeed Ghanaians are stranded there and their numbers are large enough, they are repatriated back into Ghana. So, uh, Thank you very much, Ibrahim Al Hassan. What else is happening in Parliament today? Well, as we speak, um, on the floor of Parliament is a uh, Minister for Health, Kweku Ajimamenu. He's here to answer a question regarding, if you realize, um, there was uh, some incident of injection where some patient died, two were told. Uh, he's here to answer questions regarding the committee that was set up to investigate the particular incident uh, and for, for, for a conclusion to be brought regarding why indeed uh, these patients uh, had to die out of the injection. Aside that, uh, Sewa, the MAT talked about RTI bill today enters the consideration stage and here in essence what happens is that there will be amendment, clauses will be deleted, proposals will be carried after which a committee's report will be put together and then presented to the House for the bill to be passed into an act. Uh, we told that the controversial clause 13, and that gives a blank exemption uh, to a number of agencies regarding information from such agencies, uh, will be deleted. I've seen a proposal myself uh, that speaks to that effect, that that blanket exemption is given in the bill assistance will be deleted. A number of proposals have also been made. One key proposal comes from MP4, uh, Suhum Honabo Pariansa, who is proposing that if there is any petition to the presidency, the content of that petition must be made known. It shouldn't be exempted uh, from uh, information that should be available to the public upon request. Sewa. The no bed syndrome that has hit the entire nation, specifically the surgical and emergency unit of the Hollywood Teaching Hospital. Well, the health minister has not touched on that yet, and that's because what happens in Parliament is that once a question is filed, uh, the minister is notified of the question, prepares his answer, and then appears on the floor to answer that specific question. If in the course of answering the question, some members of parliament bring other matters to his attention, the speaker has a discretion as to whether to allow the minister answer that question or not. In this case, that was not what happened. The minister came to answer a specific question, which he did. No member of parliament asked any follow-up question regarding happenings at Kodebo. So we don't have an answer to that effect yet. I'm sure it's left to us, members of the media, to prove further, and that we will do to bring answers to our viewers regarding the precarious situation at Kodebo, where patients have had to buy plastic chairs, some lying on the floor to receive treatment. And even with a directive from Kodebo that there should be no referrals whatsoever to the emergency centre because they have their hands full. All right, thank you very much. Ibrahim Al Hassan is our parliamentary correspondent joining us live to tell us what has been happening on the floor today. Away from that, the management of the Ghana Water Company Limited has decried the continuous encroachment on the buffer zones of the Waiter Dam. The situation they anticipate will affect any future expansion plans if the Municipal Assembly does not step in. The encroachment of the dam is also increasing operational cost 
of the treatment as they are forced to purchase more chemicals. Alice Aite toured the dam and the production sites and there's more in the following report. The Wager Dam, which was constructed in 1978, supplies potable water to about 80% of Accra. Production at the dam, with its source from the Etiwa Forest, takes place every single day to get Ghanaians potable water after going through a thorough cleaning or filtering process. The Wager Dam is, however, facing a massive encroachment that has extended to its entire stretch. Many buildings continue to spring up along the catchment area of the dam. This has left Accra's major source of water heavily polluted, increasing the cost of treatment and production by the Ghana Water Company Limited. About 300 bags of alum used in treating water daily. If we look in the water, you will realize that we have some debris in it. This show what activities are going on. Some of the methods of fishing are that they harvest the weeds to create a bait for the fishing. So when the fishes come to feed on the baits, then they are able to catch them. But these things decay into our water and the growth of nutrients becomes so high, giving us very bad quality raw water. And with that, we need to spend so much in chemicals to be able to purify the water for uh, consumption. You're watching GH1 Newsroom. Let's do some business news now. Financial stocks seem to have an upper edge on other equities on the Ghana Stock Exchange. Now, my colleague Kweku Temeng has been interacting with Ifwa Mensaboons, who is a research analyst with Data Bank Brokerage. Thank you very much, Sewa Me here for passing it on to us this afternoon. Well, with the major withdrawals happening in Ghana's investment terrain, because economies like the United States of America and Europe are doing well, uh, it would look like how is the stock exchange looking like? Well, we wouldn't shortchange you with information. Definitely, when we need answers, we would make sure we get the authorities to answer some of the questions for us. If we're Mensa Bonsu is with Data Bank Research, she is with the brokerage department, and today she talks to me about the stock market. If we're many thanks for joining us. Let me find out from you how is our stock market looking like in general okay um, the stock market performed credibly well from the beginning of the year we saw a lot of price increases which pushed the prices up quite high mm. now um, we are currently in a position where the market prices are going down but that's largely due to profit taking mm. as in when the prices go up and then investors start to take profits because they feel like they've gained a lot from the market and they like to realize some of their money. So we've recorded a trend where the stock prices have been coming down for quite a while. But since last week, Friday, we've seen a reversal where the market is actually picking up again. So yesterday's trading session ended with the market up higher and the GSC Composites Index currently has a return of 13.26%. Alright, so uh, if you don't have enough information, you need a broker to assist you so that you're not just buying on sentiments but you are actually looking at reasons why you want to invest in that particular stock. Don't you also forget that when it comes to stocks, you have the potential to lose or to gain and gain even more. So you're yeah, it's a factor. We apologize for cutting in. They will bring you the full interview in a subsequent broadcast. However, coming up now is international news. Zimbabwe's President Emerson Mnangagwa has launched a space agency to help farmers, mine companies and cartographers, among others. The Zimbabwe National Geospatial and Space Agency, ZNGSA, is expected to use observation satellite and drones, among other hardware, to help in its work. AFP News Agency reports that the ZNGSA was launched alongside two other new organizations aimed at modernizing the country. According to the state-owned Herald newspaper, the president is currently campaigning ahead of the elections on 30th July, the first since the ousting of President Robert Mugabe last year. His main challenger is the leader of the Movement for Democratic Change, Nelson Chamisa. 
Uganda police have fired tear gas and live bullets into the air to disperse a small protest over the social media attacks. Reports say that the police also tried to arrest the leader of the protest, MP and musician Robert Kegulani, who is popularly known as Bobby Wine, but he managed to escape. The tax introduced at the beginning of the month requires people to pay 200 Uganda shillings, equivalent to a zero point. 0.05 US dollars before they can use services like Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp. Parliament approved the tax in May after President Yoweri Museveni had pushed for the changes, arguing that social media encouraged gossip. However, some argue that it is a way of restricting critical comments about government. U.S. President Donald Trump has suggested Germany's imports of Russian natural gas are a security concern as he and other NATO leaders gather for a summit at talks in Brussels with NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg. He said it was a very bad thing for NATO that Germany was totally controlled by Russia. He suggested 70 percent of Germany's gas imports were Russian, but the latest official figure was actually 50.75 percent. He has accused Europeans of failing to pay enough for NATO operations. The Brussels summit comes less than a week before Trump is due to hold its first summit with Vladimir Putin in Helsinki, reviving concerns among U.S. allies over his proximity to the Russian president. President Trump shocked some by quipping that the NATO summit might prove harder than next Monday's summit with Putin. That will be it from us here on Newsroom. My name is Sewa Ami and on behalf of the entire production team led by Red One Karim Dini Osman, thank you very much for watching. We'll be back again at 325 with more news. Have a good afternoon.